and um, brilliant. And it, just a couple of quick um, comments. I hope you've all got the chocolate with you because Lauren and I spent lots of time trying to figure out which ones it would be. Well, actually, mainly Lauren. So if, if you like the chocolate, which I'm sure you all will do, it's Lauren. It's nothing to do with me. Um, uh, no, it was both of us. It was a, it was a good mix. But it was your idea. So, it, I mean, I have to sort of say I'm hugely grateful for you for doing this. And, you know, you definitely had all the, the good stuff on this. If you've got some water, um, if you've got some tea, if you've got some wine, or, or in Lauren's case, if you've even got some sort of polenta, just correctly <laughs> sort of, um, you know, cleanse your palates. That's all absolutely fantastic. Um, we use something called menti.com, which is a way for everybody to sort of share their impressions. So even, you know, especially when you've got like 50 to 100 people, and this is slightly smaller, but it, it is great actually to compare with one another your different impressions of the different bars um, as you go through it. Um, so we'd ask you to do that if you can, um, especially given this is such a, an expert audience on tasting. Um, and um, yeah, so, so welcome. It's going to last about an hour, I would think, the presentation, um, tasting these different bars, telling us a bit about what we do, asking lots of different questions. And then we'd love to throw it open to you for some questions. We've got some proposals too for the last half hour or so. Um, this is the first bar that we would taste. And this is just to put everybody sort of on the same plate. And Lauren is going to come in here very quickly too. Um, this is the bar which we're first going to taste. But I thought what actually might be quite fun is we basically have a sort of slightly different way well maybe it's not that maybe it's exactly the same way and i would love to basically get lauren's feedback on on some of the things that we do when we think about tasting to sort of see how you do it differently so um i'm sure you all sort of are used to tasting wine so you know the sort of the etiquette so sort of put your hand over the top and swirl it all around and then give it a sniff and everything else like that and, and the reason why you put your hand in it i was shown by a friend is actually two different things one of which is it does actually release the aromas more but the second is it stops it falling all over you if you slurp it around too fast now for chocolate what we try and get everybody to do is a slightly different way of tasting so we actually think that one of the most important things that you can get everybody into just to sort of get them thinking about it quite seriously is to take a piece of chocolate and basically snap it not drop it on the floor like i just did but snap it and so the, the thing which we always encourage them to do is to snap and the reason why we encourage that snap is, as you all know, that snap basically tells you whether or not the bar has been properly tempered. And that determines quite a lot about whether or not it's going to release flavors in the way that we would like it to. And, and Lauren's already on to the next part, which is to give it a, a good sniff. <laughs> and then the other thing that we try and do, especially with novices, which you guys aren't, is just to sort of show you the flavor and how it suddenly sort of hits you. We love to sort of suggest that everybody basically holds their noses and then takes a small bit of chocolate and just drops their tongue on it. Drops the chocolate on their tongue. I will get it to speak correctly. Um, what should be happening is you should be getting some tastes at this point, but you shouldn't be able to get many flavors. And if we wait for like another 10 or 30 seconds, what should suddenly happen before you all asphyxiate is that when you release your nose and you breathe in and out, that's when you should be hit by this extraordinary flavor wave. Because I don't know, I mean, stop me if, if you all know this stuff already, but one of the unique things about being human is that we can actually detect flavor with our mouths. Very, very few other animals can do this. So most other animals can get their olfactory system or their sense of smell to work by giving something a sniff. But literally humans are one of a handful of animals which can do this thing called retronasal olfaction. Um, and it's basically because we lack something called the transverse lamina. And there's a great theory, which I think chocolate holds up and epitomizes, is that the reason why we have human civilization is that we learn to cook because we love flavor so much. And this is all because we lack this thing called the transverse lamina. But, but chocolate is, I think, the most amazing way of explaining how flavor works. And so the other thing that we try and do is that I think you should all have in your packs this piece of paper. Um, and what this piece of paper is the result of, and, and if we could have got Laurel on, on, on the panel, we would have, but it's the, work, it's the result of basically doing some work with um, Professor Barry Smith, who's the Professor of Philosophy at London University, and also a, a great expert on senses and on taste and on flavour. A wine by a master of wine called Rebecca Palmer, and the World Brewster Champion from the UK, a guy called James Hoffman. And what they sort of suggested to us is that great products like great wines or great coffees, you actually want to go on a journey. Um, and, and so what we try and do is sort of get people to break down the different stages of how the chocolate melts and you enjoy it. So the first thing you're going to get is the texture. Um, and, you know, clearly those of you who are used to having something like Taza know that you can have grainy bars, but most chocolate bars are going to be smooth. And then the question is, well, is it more like velvet? Or is it more like silk? And then you're going to start getting the taste. But then as the aromas basically 
start to release through heat, you get this amazing sort of wave crashing over you of all the different first set of flavors that you're going to get. And then as time sort of goes on, you get another set of um, flavors coming through, generally because the bonded volatiles in the chocolate are released by enzymes in your saliva. And we can we can chat more about that in a minute if you want. But it's, it's interesting science. And it's actually really interesting because you basically don't get it when you taste this sort of crap. Because am I allowed to be rude and use bad words? But basically, the big one of the big differences, once you get into craft chocolate, it's like getting into good wine. You have this extraordinary wave. So um, anyway, and, and the only other thing I would say, and this is the reason why we love to use menti, and then I'm going to get Lauren to talk a bit about how she, she tastes, is we very much like sharing flavor notes with one another. Uh, and actually, I like menti to do this, because if you've got, when you do this in person, there's always one guy who sort of shouts a bit more loudly. I'm sorry, it generally is a guy. It's not generally a lady, but... It, is they're more bossy and everything else. But, um, and actually, that's quite off-putting. But on menti, it's all anonymous. But the great thing about flavor is that actually, it's uh, there's this sort of great thing called the tip of your nose. Um, and um, it, there will be a, a password for menti in just one sec. I promise it'll be coming up. Um, but thank you, good question. Um, th th um, but, but what happens is, is that you can't quite articulate what that flavor is. So what we try and do is just not or not suggest the words, but we put it up there. But it's also, if you see a word, then you start to look for that too. And there is this extraordinary thing. Of, it's not like colors. When we look at colors as human beings, we can actually see lots of them at the same time and identify them. Flavor is much more tricky in that actually, there's something called the Lang limit, which means that you can only identify two or three flavor notes at any one time, which is why this journey becomes even more important. Right. I will now shut up and hand over to Lauren to give you her views on tasting, which are, which are much, much, much better. And again, yep. this is the first bar that we're going to taste. I don't actually, if you could go back to that, Spencer, that would be great. I think um, I wouldn't say mine are much more. My, you know, everybody has their way of tasting, but honestly, it's really not that much different. And I've actually learned quite a bit from you. I think you've clearly done the deep dive on um, the science of tasting. Uh, and I'm curious, how did you, how did you, it sounds like you had a group of experts that you mentioned. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with, um, if you can go back another slide? Yep. How you, how you developed your, your understanding of tasting and the science of tasting? What, how did you get there personally? Um, so I personally got there bizarrely through meeting, um, through, through, through actually more initially through wine and coffee and then rapidly into chocolate. And it was meeting this guy called Professor Barry Smith, who is literally the professor of philosophy at London University, but got bored and then decided that what he'd do is just start analysing the whole idea of science and taste and, and the science of flavour. And I don't know how much you guys know about this, but actually the science of flavour is incredibly recent. So the Nobel Prize was won in 2004 by these extraordinary scientists, Linda Buck and Richard Axel. And they were the first people to actually really understand how that thing, the old battery system works. And there's a ton of stuff that we really, really don't understand. And I'm not doing this, um, this is not prepped because it's all gonna fall over the floor. But if you want a fantastic book on, um, on, on, on the whole history and actually what's going on in flavor, this book is amazing. It's written by an East German lady studying in, actually who's a, I think a, a, a lecturer now at Indiana University, but she works a lot with Barry. And, and it's a, I'll, I'll put it in the chat or I'll put it in the, the email at the end, but it's, it's a really great book. But what I love about chocolate is that one of the best ways to tell good chocolate apart from mass produced chocolate is this flavor way. And, and that was the thing that I came across. And I thought, well, why has nobody really written about this? And there is a, an enormous amount of gut written about flavor, um, most of which is just not very scientific. And so we've just done lots of deep dives into it, learning from, in other industries, I think they've done a lot more work candidly than they have in chocolate. And, and it's partly because um, we did actually do some work with Mars on this. I'm not sure how much we should, I mean, you know, it didn't, not, not a lot came from it. I was really impressed by some of the Mars scientists, but because of what they're doing, they're much more focused on taste because taste you can really control. And if you think about what goes into most mass produced chocolate, it is sugar and it's salt and it's playing with the bliss point. Um, yeah. Whereas this is all about savoring. You know, mass produced is all about scoffing. We want people to savor. I think it's interesting because you kind of alluded to the fact the chocolate industry has no standard, right? So if you look at the specialty coffee industry, they've come up, they have a flavor wheel. It is the standard flavor wheel of specialty coffee, specifically meaning, you know, the, the fine flavor like 
like uh, coffee. I'm not a coffee person, so I'm using chocolate terminology. Um, but chocolate doesn't have that. And there's actually an international group trying to put it together, but it's surprisingly political. Um, I was talking to somebody who was in the coffee industry who said to me, well, it took us 25 years. So I'm hoping it doesn't take chocolate to that. But the, you know, on the one hand, it makes it very, um, um, I'd say egalitarian and that, you know, there's nobody telling you what you should taste, which I think is great. To me, that's much more approachable. The downside is um, for people, you know, like us who are in the industry, everybody has a different vocabulary for how they describe things. And I think the other thing, especially coffee industry did was the way they set up, the way they evaluate coffee is based on, you know, what you see on your screen right now. It's not based on ref cultural reference points. So for example, I know when we're judging the International Chocolate Awards, there's lots of different flavors that we're looking at. You know, is it a cherry? Is it a raspberry? Is it a guanabana? I'm like, I've never had a guanabana. I don't know what that tastes like. So I think the thing that coffee has done really well is trying to focus on how they um, evaluate the different tongue tastes and the different tastes in a way that is not culturally specific. Um, you know, I don't know if we'll ever get to that point in chocolate. Yeah, I think it's very difficult. I think the other thing which coffee's got, which chocolate doesn't have, and by the way, we're gonna, I think we should encourage everybody to, to, to keep going on this chocolate in a minute we're going to share. Well, let, let's get everybody to share it and we'll keep going okay. on the coffee. So let's all basically, this is where you use Menti. And basically what you need to do is go to menti.com. And then the numbers you need are 95, 37, 1413. And it will stay the same the whole way through. So it, it's very simple to use. And just literally any impressions that you have, um, just, just throw them up there. But I think that going back to um, what you were saying about coffee, I mean, because we've talked a lot about this on Lauren before, I mean, because I think, you know, the other thing which specialty coffee's got is that it's got this amazing scoring system. So it actually has a definition, you know, to be a specialty coffee, you have to score more than... Um, you know, I think it's 82 points it's, or something. Yeah, something like that. But And it's through this process of cupping, and it's actually done, you know, often at the farm. And chocolate's tried to do this, but I actually think that one of the problems that chocolate has is that there are so many more steps after making a chocolate bar than there are yeah. with coffee. So with coffee, it's basically what happens on the farm, you know, what cocoa you're growing, where you're going to grow it, how you ferment it. So that's very similar to chocolate. But then it's just how you roast it, just in inverted commas, but just bear with me just on the just. And then it's just, what does the barista do? Now, a chocolate, you know, I mean, I think some of you are up in Seattle, so you all know, you know, the great stuff that Fresco do. You know, he can make two bars which have just got different roast tastes, completely different, and then they can taste completely different again. He's going to throw a different crunch onto it. And I know that you can do that to an extent with coffee, but I think one of the challenges with chocolate is actually where do you do that scoring? Um, well, and I, I think what your point plays into a number of things. It's not only this, how difficult it is, because it, it's also from a business model perspective. So coffee, you're, you're taking these beans and you're, you're roasting them and you're putting water through them and you're done with chocolate. As you point out, you've got, you know, all this, you've got at least four or five more pieces of capital equipment. Now imagine being down on a farm and you want to evaluate the flavor. You could evaluate the bean but you're not going to be able to evaluate the finished product very effectively. One, because as Spencer mentions, you know, everybody's got their own individual approach. They're changing all these variables each time. So, you know, one chocolate maker's bar is going to be very different than another. So even if they're making chocolate on the spot for the farmers to taste, it's going to be different. Right. But also it's, it's impractical to be able to do that in a, you know, a developing country where there's very little infrastructure and you're trying to make quick decisions. So I think it is really challenging chocolate. It's it's not it is like coffee in many ways, and then it's very different in other ways. Yeah, I, in a way, I think wine is actually sometimes a bit easier. But it, 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 I mean, it, it, you know, I think it is very very tricky. But I love these descriptions that people have got. I love the mouth watering one too. I think that's absolutely that's absolutely spot on. I think Brian Graham and Dahlia actually are. I, I think they're you know just amazing chocolate makers. But I think that these these points the mouth watering the astringent and the, all, all the citrus notes and all the sort of berry fruits i think are absolutely spot on that too and, and, and the vegetable too but the, the, the sort of the acid and all that sort of stuff but it, it, it to me one of the aspects of brian's chocolates not the milks but the the, the, the darks in particular they do have this 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 mouth watering aspect to them which um i don't know how he does it um i mean he does use a different conch to most other people so i don't know if you guys know this but, but most in europe at least the two sources of conches that most people use are the old longitudinal conches, 
um, which they sort of, you know, inherited 100 years ago, or in Mikhail Frisholm's case, they bought them recently. And then the other thing we all use is Indian lentil grinders. So, so, so you know, it, it's that it's, um, whereas what Brian uses is very different. He uses a Macintyre, um, which is, you know, which, which uh, as a, it, it, is, it does sort of create a slightly different mouthfeel and a slightly different impression, but maybe that's part of what it is. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so um, can we back up a second? We, we didn't do any kind of introduction and I want to find out, I mean, I know there's a lot of people here who know me. There's probably a few people here who know you, but I'm curious, Spencer, maybe you can talk just at a higher level. Like how did you get into chocolate and how did you start Cocoa Runners? Um, so thank you very much. And then I'm going to ask you the same things about what you do. So <laughs> what, what people may not realize is that Lauren and I actually have a huge amount in common. We both worked for the same company almost at the same time. And I think that's what got both of us into e-commerce. So, so um, we both worked at Amazon. Um, I was in the UK. Um, you were and, and, and you were but, in the US. But for the Seattle crowd, just to be clear, this was in 1998. So I got to Amazon when they sold books in one country. And then we shortly after I got there, we launched music. And then we went and bought three companies, one in France, one in Germany, and one in the UK at the same time. And so now we have this UK operation. And that was probably only about 10 months after I got there. And Spencer and I did not know each other until recently. Like I'd heard about him, but I didn't know him. Um, and we were introduced by a customer who I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it was funny because we started talking and we realized we were both at Amazon at the same time, him in the UK, me here in the US when it was this very tiny company. Um, so that was kind of a wild moment. When did you get there? I got there in 99. I got yeah, there I was in there nine, March 18th of 1998. There we go. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting because I have a customer. Uh, her name is Joanne Silberner. If any of you listen to NPR, I, this was like I was totally fangirling over this. I figured out she was one of my customers when she came to an event. And she used to be a national public radio um, science reporter, like on, on NPR. And so I recognized her name. And so she became a customer. It turns out we have the same birthday. We became friends. And then her husband, I believe, had a sabbatical in, in England for a year or two yeah. years. And she moved to England. And that was when she connected with Spencer. And so she came back and she joint emailed us and was like, you were my two favorite chocolate people. And next thing you know, Spencer and I start talking and realize we have this Amazon connection. We both love to open water swim. And, and we, and of course, we have chocolate together. <laughs> yeah. And I think we actually both have the same view, which is that the, 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 the trick with chocolate is how do you find great chocolate? And I think this is something we're going to talk about towards the end. And we should probably save a bit of it for them. But okay. The great thing about what I think we both learned at Amazon is that Amazon is fantastic if you know what you want. So if you know you want a book, it's great. If you know you want a video game, it's great. If you know you want a piece of music, it's great. If it's a product, though, where you need a bit of advice or a bit of curation, it doesn't work so well because it relies on you knowing what you want. It's search. It's transactional. So, if the, you know, the secret of retail always used to be, I remember what it was sort of say, location, location, location. Whereas the secret of e-tail was always search, search, search. You know, that's how they get customers. That's how you people navigate, et cetera. Whereas, you know, and, and, and we wanted to help people find chocolate in, online and we didn't want to do it so that Amazon could come in and kill us. And the great thing is, is that Amazon really doesn't know how to deal with this sort of category any more than candidly. It's great at doing, you know, there's lots of other categories which require navigation and curation where Amazon is surprisingly weak. So, well, and I, I think, too, a lot of not only Amazon, all of the, the tech companies, I think the challenge, too, is they're very good at recommending what you already like. They're yeah. not really like, you know, I, I admit I check out books from the library on and it's recommending stuff I want. But if I walk into the library, you know, there's a display that says, here's what the librarians are reading right now. And it's stuff that I might not find online that I might pick up and take home and read and love. Right. And I that's one of the most frustrating things I find about e-commerce these days and and just about online, any kind of content consumption, anything is they're just recommending things they think you're going to like. So I think with what you and I, I have done and what you're doing is, you know, um, really being able to help people find good stuff that might not be something they would pick up on their own, you know? Yeah. And, I and think actually going back to the Amazon thing, it was really funny because when I first opened Chocolopolis, which for those of you who are not in Seattle and don't know, was a retail store actually close to a year ago. Um, but a lot of my Amazon colleagues said to me, so why aren't you just doing this online? And I was like, because I want to get to know my customers. <laughs> and so for me, that was like having that physical store, which is a very challenging thing, was a very important part. And I think, but, you know, I think it's testament. I know so many of you here today and, um, and there's some that I don't know that hopefully I'll get to know. But I think for me, it is about building community. I think, Spencer, you've done that really successfully in an online model, but you've managed to build community in, in such a great way. Yeah, but, but, but I think what you've also done, though, is, is that you've shown the way that what 
I mean, what specialty coffee's got is the baristas explaining it and helping okay. you find what you want. And what you did with Chocolopolis, and I think you still do with your community, is exactly that. And that's what we try and do as well. But I mean, by the way, everyone now should just be trying the Ackersons um, and comparing notes on this. So it's exactly the same beans. They're actually grown by Bertil. Um, the, the Bijoffo estate is his family estate. Uh, he's a sweet, I don't if you, if you all, I don't know how much you know about him, but he's a Swedish. He, friend, he friend. does come to the Northwest Chocolate Festival, but I'm guessing that if people don't know him, they probably haven't met him. Yeah, you, you would definitely remember that. So I'll show you what he looks like but while you're tasting this chocolate. But, he um, looks like an explorer. He does. <laughs> and he sometimes sort of wears cravats. He's very, very English, very, very French, very aristocratic. Um, his father was a diplomat for the Swedes. Uh, ended up in in back in the fifties actually. Um, he, they ended up in Madagascar, so before Berta was even born, um, making both silage and chocolate. And this is the bit of the business which he carried on with. But but what I was just going to sort of say when we're going back, you know, what you do, which I think is just so brilliant, is that I mean I also did quite a lot in the wine industry, and and I'll give you some stats in the UK about wine. And this is the problem I think the chocolate has too. So the average time in a supermarket that somebody spends choosing a bottle of wine is less than 40 seconds. And of that, 30 seconds are spent being completely panicked and overwhelmed by the selection and the choice. And so the next 10 sec sec seconds are very simple. What people do is they look at what's on offer, then they look at what color is it, then they look at what price is it, and then they rinse and repeat. And if you think about it, that is how most people actually buy chocolate. And this is disastrous. When you go to the supermarket, I don't know how it works in the States, but in the UK, most people, you know, 20 to 30% walk out with a chocolate bar, but they don't have it on their shopping list. What actually happens is it's an impulse buy based on what have people, um, you know, what, 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 what promotion is going on this week. And that's really not very good for getting, because, you know, if it's just a sugar bomb, which is what, you know, most, at least UK supermarket chocolate is all about. It's, it, you know, it, it, that's not going to help craft chocolate because we can't discount to that way. Um, for, that we wouldn't want to either because what you want is exactly what Lauren does, which is basically, you know, find out what people are interested in and then, you know, navigate you, curate you, advise you on which bars you would like. Um, now, online, we have to do this slightly differently. Um, so we do it through things like we have a taste test. So we ask people what flavors and foods they like and then recommend bars to them. But we also do it by um, having a monthly discovery service by which you have to trust us, but it's a bit like listening to your favorite DJ. And in fact, you can get videos of us and we'll give you tasting notes and everything else like that. That's a clip. That is fantastic. Rougher on the tongue. Yeah. I, 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 now, that's actually a really interesting comment because I think you are definitely right about that. And I think that's back because Brian is using this, this McIntyre, which you can really, really finely grind and conch to. Whereas this is using uh, Bonat's longitudinal conch from the 1870s, which I think brings out the flavor in a fantastic way, but it, you do get a slightly grainier. I mean, I, I, mean, I, would, I don't know what the microns are gonna be, but I, they're, they're clearly not the same on these two. Um, but it's the same beans, which is you know, what's really interesting here. Um, and it's just you know, showing you how different roasting, um, Brian roasts in a convection oven, doesn't he, for this? I'm not sure what Bonat uses for this one, actually. Um, then it will be a, but I like both of them. I mean, they're great. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and the Ocasin, I mean, the Ocasin's is 75% and Brian's is 74, but I think they're both adding cocoa butter. So who knows, yeah. right? Yeah, they'd definitely both be adding cocoa butter. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I really like about Brian at Fruition is, you know, he's a pastry chef by training and- Member of the CIA. Really... What? He's a member of the CIA. Yeah, I know. Well, the American must, well, <laughs> yeah, the Culinary Institute of America. So, um, but what I really like about that is I find that the best chocolate makers are people who don't say, this is my recipe, this is what I do. They adjust it depending on the beans. And I think Brian does a really good job of that. So for example, I know in his Hispaniola bar, he puts vanilla in, but I don't think he puts vanilla in this one. No, he doesn't. It's just and I it. asked him one time, why are you doing that? And he said, well, I feel like it makes that bar a better bar. So, you know, it's not like he's adhering to one recipe where this is what I put in my chocolate he's deciding based on, on the bean and, and the flavor and what he's going for. And I think he really, and he's a total perfectionist, as you can tell. Um, but I, I, to me, that's a, a, you know, a sign of a good chocolate maker is somebody who is really focused on the bean and adjusting the recipe accordingly. Yeah. And, and with a great palate. I mean, I think, you know, both he and Dahlia have great palates too. Yeah. I mean, vanilla in chocolate is interesting. I mean, he's the exception because I think in general, adding vanilla is 
in, in dark bars is generally done to hide defects to be really yeah. candid. I mean, it, it, I mean, actually the history of vanilla is fascinating. I mean, it, it's another Aztec, along with, with chili peppers, it's another thing which the Aztecs were putting into chocolate. Um, and in fact, they actually conquered the, I can't remember which tribe it was, but the sort of the Copantes or something, um, to get hold of their vanilla to add it to chocolate. Um, um, so they were, you know, the Aztecs were really into adding vanilla to it, but then they didn't have sweetness. And, and the other thing which is fascinating about vanilla is, is that it's very, very culturally specific. So if you've ever had any of Foster's chocolate, they actually add a lot of vanilla to their spicy white bars because in Asia, vanilla is something which you add to spicy foods. Whereas here we add it to ice cream. So we associate it with being sweet. Actually, when you put it on your tongue, it's not at all sweet. It's the, it's the olfactory um, aspects and the associative aspects which are actually making you think it's sweet. Right. Um, I'm conscious of the fact we've got halfway through and we've only done two bars and we've got lots more. Okay. So I was being very optimistic. I said, yeah, but, but Laura was, uh, so I would just love to get this. I always love doing this. This is not, we're not gonna share this with anybody, but I would just love to know you're allowed to vote. Um, we're actually doing something quite fun, um, which, which you may want to come to another tasting, which is, I don't know if any of you have heard of something which is called the super taster. The super taster is just basically a very technical term for um, people who have a receptor for a specific bitter receptor, um, TBR1 or something like that. But it, the wine industry has done a lot of work around actually sort of saying, if you are a super taster, does it impact your tasting um, wines? No one's ever done this in chocolate. So we are now doing this as part of our tasting. So we give you the piece of paper which with, 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 with prop on it, which actually tells you whether or not you're a super taster. And then we basically differentiate and we try and see whether or not super tasters actually do have different preferences to other people. Um, so yeah, okay. I've, I've always I, wondered about that because I've, I've heard, and I, I don't know if I'm a super taster, I don't think I am, but I've heard that super tasters can't handle bitter things very well and that it can get in the way of them being able to eat certain things, but I, I don't yeah, know. That, that, that is true. That, that's the theory that they can't have, um, that because they can't have very bitter vegetables. They don't like green vegetables. Right. Right. Um, but uh, there are some upsides to it. You don't like tobacco either, but actually our very preliminary analysis is, I'm not sure that's right. Um, and I, the other thing is actually that the reason why I think it's actually a slightly spurious thing is that you've got 30, you've got between 24 and 32 different bitter receptors in your body, um, some on your tongue, some all the way down to your gut. And this, these prop and PTC tests actually only test one of them. So anyway, but yeah, it, it's a, it's an interesting area. Um, there you go. We've seen Bertel. Um, and this is more pictures of his estate and what else he's doing there. Um, anyway, um, I mean, it's pretty extraordinary what he does. Um, he does actually also produce a Criollo too, which we should talk about. Right. And he actually produces a lot of pepper. He does, which are grown to keep the, keep the beans in the shade. Um, they're great with wine, actually. I think his pepper chocolates are fantastic with things like a Grenache or a, or, or a, or a Cote de Rome. Um, I'm not quite sure what the American equivalent would be, but you know, it's one of those sort of Grenache spicy things. Right. Do you want to talk about Diane? Because you've probably met her. I've only ever spoken to her over Zoom. I've never actually met. I've amazing. never met Deanna, actually. Okay. I have not. <laughs> there you go. So neither Believe of us. it or not. Uh, but I think she's absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, and a great, great example of, of, of basically how putting people in a, in a state where they don't drink encourages them to have good chocolate. And for those of you who don't know that she's in Utah. So, and you know, it's funny because Utah does have a very large number of craft chocolate makers. Um, and I, I am wondering if it's partially that because they don't drink. Um, that's what I was told by Ritual. And that's what they said. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Because for those of you who are not American, Utah is a heavily Mormon state. So, um, so again, this is Coco Camille, uh, which is Simran um, um, uh, with Brian. Um, Simran is a, a, I think he's actually, is he originally Tanzanian, educated in the UK and uh, in the oh, US? I didn't think he was Tanzanian, but maybe he was. He was. He's definitely, he's definitely, I, I actually almost said Ugandan Asian, but I'm, you know, the way that, but I'm not sure about this. Bizarrely, I actually know his cousin, um, and I didn't sort of put two and two together. Um, but um, he's a fantastic bloke, and Brian is a fantastic bloke, and they set up this amazing cooperative um, in Tanzania, which I think works with, you know, hundreds of farmers now. And the aim was just to sort of show that you can grow great cacao in Tanzania, which, you know, it's just a question of fermenting it properly, which he's done a really, really good job of. Um, again, I think Diane is a fantastic chocolate maker. Um, 
wonderful in what she does with her tobacco. That's, yeah, sherry. Sherry is definitely spot on. This is what I love about Menti. This is what I love about when you get the tasting notes. It's that you, I, I think that it's like when you go to a museum and you've got one of those docents who can tell you about a picture and it helps you appreciate it. I think that you guys, by basically sharing these words, you make me appreciate what's inside the chocolate in a very different way. Although there is a theory that what actually happens is, is that you, everybody can taste the same when you basically get the melt because that's just releasing the aromas. But as you go further down, as it's about 10 or 15 seconds, what's actually happening there, and this happens a lot in wine, is that um, when you heat chocolate, you get the Maillard reaction, which basically reveals some of the aromas and that sort of stuff. But it also binds various volatiles. And those can be released not just through heat, but actually more through enzymes in your saliva. So if you see some notes which you can't detect, don't worry, because actually it may just be that somebody has a different set of enzymes in their saliva to uh, what you've got in your saliva. Um, and actually, it's also a good hint. Um, be very, very wary about um, chefs who just basically recently been to the dentist, because they will have a very different sense of uh, flavor for a couple of days until they get used to it again. So they, they sort of add well, some they I feel like that's a, it's a good reminder that taste is very personal. And I think, you know, like wine, it's very standardized, as I was saying earlier. Um, I think one of the nice things about chocolate not being standardized is it, it is more approachable. Um, the reason people standardize tasting is more from a, an apple, like if you're trying to have a conversation with somebody. So I'll give you an example. For those of you that know Fran's chocolate here in Seattle, you know, they make their own bonbons and they make enough that Valrona, the French chocolate company, will make them their own couverture from the bean. Well, Fran's son, Dylan, who is the current um, chocolatier for Fran's, was the first roaster for Scharfenberger chocolate. So if you know Scharfenberger, they kind of started this craft chocolate bean to bar movement back in the day. And he was the first roaster. So he's roasted beans and he knows exactly what he wants out of them. But the problem was he was trying to explain that to Valrona. And um, they have a very different vocabulary for how they describe taste. And so his sister told me, she runs a company now. She was like, oh yeah, Dylan had to go to France for two weeks and take a crash course in Valrona's tasting so that he could describe what he wanted in the chocolate. And so I think that's why there is a reason why people standardize tasting. With that said, even if it's standardized, you know, you are going to have your own taste memories from childhood and, and your own experiences in life. And, and that's really going to inform what you taste. And so I always say, you know, there's no wrong answer is what you taste is, is what you taste. And it may be, you may describe it or taste it differently than I do for many of the reasons Spencer has already mentioned too. Um, buttery is very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, shall we now move on to, I think I was, I was trying to work out which is gonna be the most international bar that we're gonna to taste tonight. And I think this is gonna be the winner. Um, that's by the way, a picture of Diane, that knows of her beans obviously. So this chocolate, which again is the same beans, it's the um, Coca Camille beans. It's actually the same percentage, I think. Is it not yet? They're both 70%. Yeah, they're both 70. But um, let me just show you the, 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 the makers. So this is made, in sort of deepest, darkest bits of Norway, don't ask me exactly where, um, by, um, I know because we sort of have to send labels to get the chocolate sent to us and everything, about, but it's made by the most extraordinary pair. So um, one is Basque um, and the other is Korean. And they are living in this bit of Norway where they speak in a bizarre dialect, um, where the word fiak actually means, if you open the packaging, you're going to get this. It sort of means it's for their sort of, you may have sort of heard all these sort of great words from like Hige and all, all these other things, which Denmark's meant to have its contribution to world civilization. Well, this is the Norwegian equivalent, which is basically lovable and huggable um, and, 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 and sort of, you know, true and everything else like that. And this is what Sven and, and, and um, you know, the, the, these, these two brilliant lady chocolate makers are doing. So these are beans from, you know, um, um, Tanzania, um, Coco Camille, they are um, grown by, well, the, 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 the fermentation is run by a Irishman and a uh, Brit, honorary Brit, I think. I'm probably, I don't I'm probably got American citizenship by now. He's definitely got an American baby because he, the daughter was born there. And then made by a, 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 a half Korean um, who is, whose family went over there after the Korean War and um, by a Basque lady uh, in the middle of Norway. So I defy anybody to basically come up with a more international product um, than, than, than what we're going to have here. Um, and actually, I'm very sad. We hope that they're going to be coming to Canopy Market. We're running 
after two years, we finally basically managed to pull it back together again. We've actually got a small chocolate fair up in London. So if any of you are sort of near to London, or if you are in London, do come not this week, but next weekend um, to King's Cross um, up near the Waitrose. Outside there, we will have 10 or 12 different chocolate makers. Unfortunately, not with Fiat. They were meant to be coming, but they can't figure out how to get through Britain's COVID restrictions. Um, but we do have Mikel for his home, the Great Dane. Um, so anyway, let me just let me just get everybody back onto um, the, the chocolates. Um, though I, I missed it. Um, right. We didn't do Menti. There we go. There we go. And again, it's the same number. It should now be showing on your screens. And um, just sort of tell us what you think. Multi. Hmm. It's funny. I, I, I find, whereas I can generally identify Madagascar quite easily, I actually find Coco Camille, which a lot of makers use. I mean, I think we've got like 30 different bars from Simran's Beans. Um, and I find it a very difficult um, origin to test. I think it's, it's, it's very flexible in how makers can interpret what they want to do with it. It's got lovely bass notes. I don't find it has a ton of high notes. It has the, the notes that you've got here. I think absolutely right. Um, blood, sweat. Is there a tears up there? Are we going to get tears? <laughs> um, interestingly, maybe because it's in the morning, we often find that people throw the word cooling up because when you suck chocolate as you you know it, it sort of stands to reason that you're basically um releasing the flavors by using your body heat so it actually will cool you down so i always basically try and encourage kids to go when we do the kids tastings to go back to their parents and say on a hot day i need some chocolate because it's going to cool me down um i was just going to say back on your point about um tanzania beans i mean i don't know what the genetics are there but i'm assuming they're not that diverse they're not that diverse. Okay. Yeah, and so try and do some work. Yeah, I mean that's the other thing. You've got the beans in West Africa and East Africa are not going to be that genetically diverse. And then Madagascar actually does have Criollo beans, and that's what a lot of Bertil's estate is, right? So yeah. theirs are going to have more of that flavor. Whereas Africa, you know, I, I, you know, this is the thing though. I mean, Africa produces very nice beans, like Ghana, Tanzania. There's certainly you can get nice beans there, and I think it goes back to. Genetics are important, but they're not the only thing, right? If they're doing yeah. a good job at fermentation and drying, you can get a really nice bar of chocolate out of these beans. They might not have that range of flavor that's something that was considered genetically superior might, but but you can get a very nice bar of chocolate with a decent range, I think. I think that's right. I mean, I, I think these are Trinitaria Amalandos, I think, which is basically true of Barunga too, and a lot of the Ghanaian beans. Yeah. Um, they came in a very weird way, didn't they? They sort of, they, the, the theory is that or maybe it's Madagascar. The theory is that they got to Madagascar actually via the Philippines, which was a sort of strange way around. Um, but the genetics, it, I mean, it is amazing actually how little work there is. I know that everybody sort of thinks there's tons of work on cocoa genetics, but actually it, there is a lot less than people think there is. So, I mean, you know, whether we should be using the terms Criollo, Trinitario or Forestero, lots of people say we shouldn't. I actually think that what Lauren was doing is right, which is that basically if you look at the good maps, that is what they basically will tell you. And then within them, you've got the heirloom varieties. Um, it was interesting because back back in when they first started the cacao genome project here in the US, um, the United States Department of Agriculture and Mars started this cacao genome project. And the fine chocolate industry said, hey, wait a minute, you know, you guys are off like genotyping this stuff for flavor. What, you know, we want to do some heirloom and stuff. And so at the time, this organization that I'm part of um, put up the money so that they could genotype some cacao beans. And the first ones they did were Madagascar. And I remember it was uh, Brett Beach, who at the time was with Madagascar and is now with Mia Chocolate. Um, they handed him a bunch of like silica um, powder bags to take with them to Madagascar. He actually told a story about like, well, you know, it felt like a drug runner, but... <laughs> I figured who's going to be bringing drugs into the country. They're probably not going to stop me. Um, but he went and he actually cut a lot of leaves off trees and brought them back for the USDA to uh, genotype. And it was actually a high percentage of Criollo. And I remember he was presenting to, to the group after they had come up with this and he kind of, and I, so it's interesting what you were saying, Spencer, about the Philippines, because, you know, his comment was Madagascar being a, 
a former French colony, his comment was leave it to the French to bring the good stuff over. <laughs> yeah, although were they originally, I mean, the, the, the original plantations um, in Madagascar were actually on the, weren't in San Barano Valley, they were actually up on the coast and they okay. got washed out by, um, they got washed out by typhoons in the 1820s, 1830s. There are now some people, I think it's, I always get it wrong, whether it's Marva or the other one from Shocker Madagascar, one of the two, Bohim Banani, I think it is, it is actually back there. And actually they do taste completely different, but it okay. is now the same beans. But it goes back to your point about the fermentation. So I, I, it, it, it's assuming it's Bohim Banani, which is the one on the coast. It's much, much nuttier, much, much woodier. And it does not have any of the characteristics of the red fruits that you get. And I, I do think that, the fermentation is actually one of the fascinating areas. I mean, I don't know if you if you sp followed, um, if anyone's sort of followed, I, I don't know if anyone's doing it in the States as well, but um, now Pump Street, um, Chris Brennan, who's a baker and a science geek who used to be at IBM, is actually sending out sourdough yeasts to get people to um, ferment those bars for him in a different way. And there's about to be a new bar that he's about to release with this too. Um, so, you know, and, and that actually it's out now, the Jamaican, he has two different Jamaican bars. Um, Wait, so he's sending the sourdough yeast to Jamaica for the fermentation? Yeah. To kick oh, off wow. The That's yeah. really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, but you can get it. I mean, you get this a lot. I mean, I think that's the reason why, you know, whenever you sort of see the Ecuadorian chocolates, you know, one of the reasons why I think the different makers are different. It, it, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 they are still using Arriba Nacional, but it's the different farms have got different, you know, yeasts and different microbiomes and different enzymes on the bacteria, which are getting into what they've got. Right. I mean, I feel like a lot of terroir is is the, the fermentation and the bacteria and yeast. And I think for you, just in case people aren't clear, it is wild fermentation. So like if like you're making sourdough or sauerkraut, it's whatever bacteria or yeast are in the air. And in most cases in chocolate, that's true, too. It's wild fermentation, which yeah, is, is not the case in wine or, you know, other industries where they're inoculating with certain things. I mean, that's not to say there are people in the chocolate industry who are playing with inoculation and in Hawaii, they have to do some of that. But but most chocolate is wild fermentation. So you really are getting that sense of terroir. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you, if you take something like Maru, that's a really good example, I think, of actually how different fermentations were. Because, you know, Vietnam is basically one bean type. But, you know, Baria tastes utterly different to Ben Trey. Or, you know, I mean, I know there are a couple of, uh, before, you know, I'm, I forget that this is a very expert audience. So I know there are some other beans in Vietnam, but, but, but fundamentally, the fermentation is a fairly big bit. Now, hopefully, this is this is a new maker for at least some of you in Seattle. But if you're in England, you're all going to know the wonderful Jan and Jonathan. And again, they will be at Canopy Market. And this is this is this is um, brand new. This this bar hasn't been around for more than six months. So this is their Semel Kiki, uh, the, the Ugandan bar. And we're going to try actually the bar made in Uganda in a minute too. But this is their interpretation of this bar, and they, they are a fantastically good chocolate maker. Dan is, I mean, absolutely brilliant. Um, and, um, you know, I know that if Chocolopolis was still going, she would be out there in a flash. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I happen to break off pieces from both of these bars so that I can min minimize my rustling. And the color on them is very different Yeah. Um, on the Tossier versus the Latitude Craft chocolate. Yeah, I wonder what that is. I mean, I presume it's a different roast. Is Tassier definitely getting them from um, Latitude? Because I know there's other sellers in that valley too. Yeah, no, they're definitely coming in from Latitude because they're bringing okay. brought in by uh, Kate Cavalin. So they're coming in through okay. um, Econ. Yeah. Because he's distributed by... Um, it's the one we're getting with now. No, he, he's distributed by Common over here. But I think in the States, he's actually distributed by... Um, the Italian sounding guy who just had a kid. This is my brilliant Saturday evening, I'm trying to remember names. Um, well, it's not Italian. Oh, Gino. Gino. It's Meridian no. Cacao. Meridian Cacao. It's Meridian. Woo! So I know he's not Italian. You going to put the menti up? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> hmm. Mine's not updating. Oh, there we go. It takes a couple of seconds. The servers are in um, Sweden and we're sort of running it by the UK. It should be coming up. Let me yeah, know. It is. A lot to think about. 
So again, to me, I'm just putting in my notes here. You're about to see them. Barnyard. Hmm. I don't know. So to me. That was I, me. I got a lot of barnyard, actually. No, I think that's good. I, I get grainy. So to me, although it's got a lovely melt, it's got a lovely snap, there's a li- it's, it's definitely not mouth-watering, you know, back to what people were using to describe Brian. It's definitely not astringent, but it is sort of slightly drying in the mouth. And I think this is because of, she's using the cocoa tans, she's using the lentil grinders. Mm. Um, and she doesn't add a ton of cocoa butter. Um, and I love that sensation. I think it's really interesting because you really want to savour it and it really coats your mouth. So you can really get that second aspect of the flavour wave as it sort of comes down. Um, um, I think, you know, just to draw on that, I think the cocoa butter comment, you know, to me, that also goes back to a really good chocolate maker as somebody who chooses whether or not to add cocoa butter based on the bean, right? So the ones who are really good, some recipes, they might add it, others, they might not, but they're adjusting it based on the bean. They're not saying I either don't add cocoa butter or I do. Um, and there's, you know, there's some companies that kind of pound their chest and say, we make two ingredient chocolate. And I'm like, well, that's great. But if it's not, you're not giving me a good bar of chocolate, <laughs> maybe you should add some cocoa butter. Um, because, you know, the beans, while they have about equal parts, cocoa butter and cocoa solids, it does vary. And so some beans are lower in cocoa butter naturally. So even if a chocolate maker adds cocoa butter when they're making it, they might still have a total amount of cocoa butter that's less than some other bean has naturally. And, and that really does affect both texture and flavor. So I, I sort of feel like, you know, again, adjust your recipe based on what you're going for. How do you feel about that, Spencer? I think that's true. I think that a good chocolate maker will be looking at mouthfeel and will be looking at flavor and you will definitely get different flavors coming out depending on the amount of, you know, um, cocoa butter you add to it because it'll, it'll affect the release. So, I mean, to me, you know, wine has this great thing about different glasses, you know, different glass will, will, will impact the way it throws the wine onto you chocolate will do the same and there are two different ways that you can do that one of which is the shape of the mold how thick it is and how thin it is and then the other one of which is of course how much cocoa butter you put in it because that will determine how it will release um there is also an obviously an argument about tempering as well and how recently you've tempered because that will yeah. do it but, but, but fundamentally there's a lot more to it there's a lot of art i think and science in how you sort of play with this um right but fantastic Descriptions, fizzy, yes, barnyard. I, hmm. Now, so to me, the barnyard comment is really interesting when we try the next, hold on, what have I done wrong here? Latitude, sorry. Um, this chocolate, um, it, it, I mean, well, actually, you know you know Jeff better than I do. I met Jeff the first time, what, three or four years ago when I, I thought he was completely bonkers. Um, he was wandering around with some pretty difficult to taste bars in um in, i think he hit me up at the same time <laughs> and i was thinking okay um you know i love what you're trying to do i think it's absolutely brilliant but how are you ever going to make chocolate out there and you know he has completely blown me away so we actually now use this bar and the 80 percent uh, which is in the green just to show how sugar in chocolate sugar is not just and should not really be a sweetener what it should actually be is a flavoring agent and this is a brilliant example of the 70 to the 80%. I don't know why I'm talking about this here because this is not what we're tasting, but just to me, he is such a good chocolate maker that he can actually show you completely different flavor notes from just slightly changing the amount of sugar that you've got in there. And it's not the sweetness which changes, it's actually the way that the sugar brings out the flavor. But before I was, as I was sort of saying before, this actually, you've got it, Lauren, you've absolutely got it, this is barnyard. There is something slightly, you know, manure um, there's almost that sort of, you know, the nitrogen sort of stuff. You do get. It was funny because about that same time he came into Chocolopolis. And like I said, he has family here. So now he comes like once a year. But um, I didn't remember this. He told me this this summer. He was like, oh, yeah, I came in and I gave you samples. And I went ahead and tasted them on the spot, which I normally don't do because he was coming from Uganda. And I was like, OK. And apparently I said to him, um, you know, this is fine, but like, I'm, I, well, maybe not fine, but I just kept saying, I, I couldn't get past the taste of what tasted like brown sugar. I said, everything you've given me tastes like brown sugar. So he said to me, so I went back to Uganda and I'm trying to figure out like, where is this flavor coming from? And he's like, I'm sitting in my place. And then like, I happen to look over and there's this giant bag of sugar. That's like Uganda sugar. And it had some comment on it about like, you know, it was sugar made in Uganda, proudly like unrefined with its famous, like maple flavor. <laughs> <laughs> like you know that it naturally had 
And so he was like, okay, I got to change the sugar. Um, and I think that's one, one challenge is, you know, normally I like to eat things that are natural. I want to eat things that are less refined, but I find for me with chocolate, I don't love it when they put coconut sugar, maple sugar, no. anything unrefined because it starts to add to the flavor. Yeah. And, you know, if, if I've had it in some inclusions where it works really well, because that's a flavored bar, right. And maybe that coconut sugar adds to the flavor, but when I'm eating a plain single origin bar, I don't want to taste the flavor of coconut sugar or maple sugar. That's my no, personal no. preference. No, I think you're completely right. I, I, we put them in, in our system actually under inclusions the, the, to us. I mean, the whole point about sugar is, you know, sucralose and fructose is they're a taste, not a flavor. If you add anything like lacuna or if you add coconut sugar or something like that, you're going to get that flavor. And chocolate's such a brilliant vector for different flavors that it's, it's it, I, I don't, I do not get it. I really, really don't get it. I mean, it's like adding vanilla. I just, it's just, you know, what are you, what are you, what are you hiding? Um, but, but, but I, you know, I have to say though, I, you know, hats off to, to Jeff. I think he's just done a brilliant job. I mean, it, it's got to be pretty tough to be making chocolate in Uganda. Um, but um, I think, this is where the, you know, the craft chocolate community is pretty supportive. So I know that like Stephen Baumier from White Label went over to Kampala and like did some training with his chocolate makers just to help him out. And, you know, Stephen buys beans from him, but, but I think it is a very collaborative community. A lot of people yeah. are, at least in the U S are really, everybody seems to know Jeff. They're all really behind him. Um, so I think, you know, it's that community coming together. And then obviously he's very determined. Um, so he has this cafe in Kampala and then he's growing the cacao um in elsewhere in uganda near the drc border um but he's got many avenues he sells the beans to other craft makers he's making chocolate in kampala and has a whole cafe around it um you know he's employing local people so he's, he's just doing amazing things yeah it's very no, impressive <laughs> yeah, it is impressive and, and they're really really good bars i mean they're, they're, you know you know I mean, if you think about the number of makers in africa you've got chocolate madagascar you've got menacal uh, or MIA, this, this, they're made in the same factory, um, and then you've got you've got him. I mean, you know, the, the, I mean, I, I know there are some others in West Africa, but I don't think they're up there yet. Um, you know, and, and it, it's hats off because he's done it very quickly. Um, but um, yeah, no, it's definitely no. He has done it very quickly <laughs> and scaled. And I mean, I think that's the the way to be successful as a, not only as a craft chocolate maker, but you know, one thing I'm very proud of is our segment of the industry, the fine chocolate industry, is very committed to trying to improve the lives of cocoa farmers around the globe. And that's not a small order. Um, with that said, it's really hard to do that without getting to some level of scale, right? Because you're not going to impact their lives unless you can buy significant volumes of cocoa. So, you know, just as an example of somebody who is completely vertically integrated, he's, you know, he's working with a thousand smallholder farmers to grow these beans and he's you know, got the centralized fermentary so he can help control fermentation, which is really critical for quality. He pays the farmers a lot more. And then, you know, he sells the beans to all these, um, you know, craft chocolate makers around the world. But then he's also making chocolate in Kampala. So he's, and I know he's trying to like scale that as well um, and possibly do other things with other companies. So you know, he is actually trying to scale this business model he has in a way that's going to actually have a very big impact um, on the farmers. And I think that's really what's challenging to do for so much of the craft industry is, you know, it's really hard to get to that scale where you really do have an impact. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, I think Simran's sort of getting there in Coca Camille then too. I mean, I, I mean, it is the challenge, you know, specialty coffee is 20, 25% of all coffee sales in the US. Um, mainly, of course, out, out of house. It's mainly in specialty. But, you know, craft chocolate is like, we've talked about this loads of times, already. it's like less than 0.1%. I mean, it's so difficult. You know, without you, there are so few places selling it in a way that actually people get what it's about. Right. It's just putting it on the shelf just doesn't really... Uh, it, 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 people people get a bit baffled as to why they're spending, you know, the different prices and what really... And they don't know how to taste and it's just, you know... Well, so. and I think that's one of the challenges too is you know, they go have what they was craft chocolate, they pay $10. If they get a bad bar or a bar that they don't like, then they think, oh, that's what all craft chocolate is like. Why am I paying for this? You know, and I used to, I would tell craft makers, when my, my, you know, my, my customers would go travel the world, bring me chocolate, meet different chocolate makers. And, and they'd say to me, oh yeah, I met this chocolate maker. You know, I'm in France, let's say, and I'm standing there having this bar of chocolate. And at that moment, it's the best bar of chocolate they've ever had because they're talking to the chocolate maker. They really like this person. They're in this having this lovely experience. But then they'd say to me, well, but I'd never buy the bar again because you know, in that moment, they, it was this wonderful experience. They loved it, but maybe the chocolate didn't live up to something that they wanted to keep paying for or enjoying. And so I think, 
you know, it's also trying to get to a level of consistency. And I use that word loosely. I'll come back to what I mean by that, where you, you know, you can at least deliver a quality product. Um, you know, I, you know, Colin Gasco, who was one of the original American craft chocolate makers of Rogue Chocolatier. And years ago, I said something about consistency and Colin said to me, I'm not trying to be consistent. And I said, you know what, Colin, let me rephrase what I mean. What I mean by consistency is I want you to, you know, it wasn't for him specifically. We were just having a debate about this in general because he made great chocolate. But I was just saying, I don't, I don't need it to taste the same every time, but I need the same level of quality. It's got to have really good texture. It's got to have flavor complexity and it's got to have, you know, pleasant flavors, not, you know, a ton of defective flavors. That's what I mean by consistency. Um, or you're not going to, you know, you're not going to have a, a, a market for this. Like people aren't going to keep buying it and they're not going to enjoy it. They're not going to be willing to pay 10 to $20 for a bar of chocolate. Um, and I think that's still something we struggle with. There's so many craft chocolate makers now. There's all this demand and there, or I'm sorry, there's all the supply, there's not enough demand. And then on top of it, um, you know, you've got to be able to produce um, some, some quality chocolate reasonably consistently. So that is a brilliant segue, I think, into <laughs> the point that we wanted to sort of make, which is that, and Laura and I have spent a lot of time talking about this, and I'm going to hand over to you just in a sec to explain how you curate it, because actually I love the way that you do it. The model we used is, so after Amazon, I did something called Last FM, which you may not have heard of in the States, but if you've heard of Spotify, we were the precursor. So we were the people who basically, you know, persuaded the labels that you should actually be able to listen to music online and all that sort of stuff. But in the music world, I actually think music has the best form of discovery anybody has ever come up with for media. And it's basically called radio. And you had DJs and you had people who you trusted to listen into to discover great new music or to discover themes and great stories behind the music. And to an extent, Last FM actually came up with the original idea of giving people the opportunity to build playlists. And it's a way of expressing yourself, but it's a way of also getting people to listen to other music, which you would enjoy and you would try. And so we've talked about this quite a lot. And the basis to Cocoa Runners is actually the idea of how do you discover great new chocolates? And so what we promised to do was initially just with dark or milk and dark was to send you four different bars of chocolate anywhere in the world. Um, we promised with those ones at least never to repeat a bar. And we've been doing it now for, you know, I think we're, you know, doing it for like six or seven years. We never have repeated a bar. We will, we'll, we'll, we'll count different vintages as being different bars, by the way, though. But we very rarely even do that. Introducing new makers all the time. We'll give you the videos. We'll give you... The stories but what we try and guarantee in this is that these are brilliant expressions of that bean and of a quality which is exactly what lauren was saying which is of great consistency so for us it's a way of how do we get you to find new stuff but give you the confidence that what you're going to get is going to be of a high quality now we select them in a slightly different way to the way lauren does and this is where i think lauren's just brilliant and genius in what she's got with you which is that we actually have just a smaller group of us who chooses um, but we probably taste over a thousand, over maybe two, three thousand. We were trying to work it out the other day, bars every year. And we probably take less than 100, 150 for, our, um, for, 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 for putting into our library. And of that, only a third of them will actually go into boxes. Um, because some of them we sort of hold over from different years, et cetera. And some of them we go back to and we buy bars from different makers, which we'll put through there too. But, but the consistency is the promise. The promise is basically, you know, you may not fall in love with the bar. It may be an origin that you just don't love, but you will like, the, the quality will be up there. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that, is, that is, you know, difficult to do in chocolate. And without you, Lauren, I think Seattle is much worse off. So, so tell us a bit about how you, you select chocolates too. Yeah. And so let me just back up briefly for the people who don't know uh, my background. So after Amazon, I opened this retail store in Seattle called Chocolopolis. And the idea was around curating a collection of bean to bar chocolate um, and arranging it by cacao origin. And this was in 2008. So at the time, there were five American craft chocolate makers, all of whom had started uh, making chocolate probably around 2006, 2007. So only a year to a year and a half before we opened. Um, and so at the time we were limited to, you know, getting a lot of like, you know, Amade, Domori, Valrona, and then the Americans. Um, but we arranged it by cacao origin. So like we had a section, a uh, Venezuela section, an Ecuador section, you know, much like you would buy online, but this was in a physical store. We would open samples, people could try them. So it was really about educating people and, and, and having this collection. And at the time we sold what was available um, because there wasn't much. <laughs> 
Um, but as the years started to go on, you know, and, and you fast forward to today, there's now hundreds, probably thousands of craft chocolate makers. Um, and so there was sort of this funky period where we went from five American craft chocolate makers, to all of a sudden we started to see more and we'd, you know, we'd automatically start bringing in their bars. It was like, oh, great, another craft chocolate maker. Let's add them to the collection. But what I started to realize was not all of them were very good bars. And so when we got to a kind of a critical mass where there were enough makers that we could choose, um, we started getting very, very picky. And, you know, I didn't want to leave it up to just me and my team, right? Because everybody has their own tasting biases. And ultimately it was about our community. And so we actually started this customer tasting panel and we would meet once a month and we would do a blind tasting and rate all of the bars we tasted. So the only thing that they would know is originally they knew origin and percent, but eventually they, the group asked me to take the origin off because they each had their own origin biases. So they would just know the percent and we would go through and taste. And, and, and the other thing was nobody would comment until we finished scoring each bar, because I think it's, you know, I, I had a situation one time with my, my team where somebody yelled out, I hate this bar. And I'm thinking, well, now nobody's going to like it. Right? <laughs> um, so we, so we used to do this once a month with customers and, and we did go through a period where we did not accept, we would decide what to bring into the store's inventory based on this. And, you know, we only accepted about 3% of what we tasted. There was a year and a half period that was incredibly frustrating because I really wanted to refresh and have some new bars and like nothing was passing. Um, and I, I feel like craft chocolate, at least the Americans and I, some Europeans, but Americans in general, because that's where the majority of craft chocolate makers were at the time, went through a period where all these new entrants came in and a lot of them didn't spend the time learning how to make chocolate before they launched their businesses. And so we were getting a lot of what I would say um, under roasted, and I don't like a heavy roast, but stuff that was like under roasted, poorly processed, just a really a lot of bad stuff. And so, so anyway, so this, this was a great way to engage the community and to engage a lot of different palates because I have my tasting biases. I know what I like and don't like. Um, and it was a representative of our customer base. And so I think there's some people on here who are actually on the tasting panel. Um, so, you know, it was a great way to build community and, and, and help us bring in things that, that the community we hoped would love. Yeah, I think, I think it's very, very clever. We've tried something slightly different, but with a similar ethos, which is what we've sort of said to any of our subscribers, I mean, actually any of our customers is, if you find a maker in a bar that you really love, and we then take it on, we'll send you a case of it as a thank you for it. Oh, so wow. We, so we try and sort of do it as a bit of a sourcing. And that, that's open to any of you too. So if you can find us makers um, um, that we can take on and we push through. Um, the other thing that we've found though, which is slightly trickier. So I'll give you a great example. I, would, I think White Label are amazing chocolate makers. Yeah. The problem we have with them is they're very expensive um, by European standards. So US bars are generally $10, 10 pounds, eight to $10, 10 pounds. European bars are generally four to seven pounds, dollars, five to seven, say. Um, now I know by the time they get to the States, they're more, but in general, the price, the equivalent price to the European bar. So this, for example, this bar we retail at about, um, I think it's $5.95, whereas this bar we have to retail at $8.95 or nine, you know. Pounds, um, right? Pounds, yeah. So yeah, but that includes VAT. So it includes our sales tax, which is 20%. And it also, um, you know, remember that the pound is like one thirty, but it gives you a sort of idea. So what we've relied on in the past is being able to basically put them in a box. So fruition, for example, you know, we were rich. I mean, love the bars, love what they do. And they're really selling well now in the UK. But I think that one of the reasons why they sell well is that we managed to get them in the boxes. But we also never want, um, and, and so we ask for a little bit. Of, if you go in the box, we ask, because it's very good value. And the box is $30 for four great bars of chocolate. So think about what you'd normally pay for craft chocolate. And that's what it is. We don't make money on these boxes um, um, because we basically put it in a cost and work it through that. But we struggle to introduce makers if we can't put them in the box because we won't force a maker to sell to us at a price which they don't make money on. Right, right. Um, but if we don't have that, it's very difficult to introduce, to get people to try a maker and then say, wow, that was amazing. I want to try yeah. all the others. So, you know, Good Now are a good example yeah. of that. We managed to sort of get early on when they were still just getting up there, some of their bars into some boxes. Now we couldn't afford it and they wouldn't want to do that either, but they've got enough of a following to do it. 
So well, that makes a lot of sense though, because you also don't want to launch somebody unless you know you can be successful with them over time. It's better for them. It's better for you. So at least if you know you can get them in a box and get people to try them and you know, you're putting your brand behind them, um, then that's how you ensure success for both of you. Yeah. Um, so I'm very conscious of the fact that you and I have been chatting a lot and I love chatting to you and we're going to do more of this. That's, that's the thing that I made you promise before we did that. So <laughs> we'll find some more, but we should open this up a little bit to other people and ask, um, you can either, um, sorry, this has gone the wrong way. Um, there was meant to be a slide, which basically said that you could ask anonymous questions, but I've managed to sort of slightly blow that. So, um, if you do want to ask anonymous questions, um, I will basically put up a slide in just a sec so that you don't have to say who you are, but do feel free now to um, basically, um, you know, any questions that you've got, any comments, anything you'd like us to do, please, um, you know, sort of um, throw it up. Um, anything just... you want to share about the chocolate or the tasting, that's that too. That'd be fun. And you can do chat or turn on your microphone, whatever you like. We have a reasonably intimate group here. Don't be shy. What could we do better? Must be too early here in Seattle on a Saturday morning. <laughs> Okay, so to make it, there you go. So you can now ask questions anonymously, or you can give us feedback. What we'd love to get from you is, what would you like us, would you like us to do this again? If so, what would you like us to feature, focus on? Just tell us anonymously. Or, um, you know, just basically, um, you know, any comments, anything we could do better, or anything else like that. And if you all want to get back to, you know, whatever it is you're going to be doing in Seattle. Okay, what would you like us to do again? What, what should we do as the theme? Again, we could pick on the same one. We could do different percentages. We could do whatever you'd like. I mean, do you want us to do sort of new bars that we don't think you've heard of? Um, would you trust us to do that? I mean, the good news is you're going to have Lauren. So I, I, Lauren's got an impeccable palette. So you'll be absolutely fine with that. I think you do too, Spencer. No, no. Um, Louisa says, do more tasting with the same bean. Um, Betsy said, really appreciate the suggestions of descriptive words. That's helpful. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to riff on that for a sec, because I think what Lauren said is right, which is that, you know, we forget that colour, Newton gave us the definitions as to how colours work. We can all agree on, you know, red or yellow, and that sort of stuff, colour colourblind, but, and, and music has the same thing, you know, pitch, rhythm, frequency. Flavour just doesn't have that. I mean, it's been going for a bit. And, and, you know, I know that people like Harold McGee have, you know, written about nosedive, but actually even there, he's very, very careful to talk about the fact that, that, you know, the association of these different molecules with these different flavors is, it is very, very subjective and not everybody's experienced lots of those different things. So I think like trying to get a common vocab is key. Um, um, Luis is also, uh, I mean, sorry, somebody's also asked, um, um, we, we, um, we we definitely do um, have recordings um, of other tastings. We do something, and actually Lauren and I thought we'd do this, which we, we didn't do it, but we do something which is basically we, we explore somebody's life through their chocolate. And so we've done this with um, Philip Kaufman of Original Beans. We've done it with James Hoffman, the World Barista Champion. And just to show you what we mean by that, what we do is we basically pick different aspects of their lives to talk about, and then we have a chocolate which sort of is somehow loosely affiliated with that. So James, for example, comes from Northumberland where people forage a lot. So he took a porcini mushroom bar from Naive, and then he won the World Barista Championship in Japan. Um, and so we basically used one of the bars from Fittoria do Cacao, which is Portuguese, but it's made by Japanese people living there, or Japanese or Portuguese people living there. So it's a bit like Desert Island Discs, um, and it's them telling that story um, of their life, but you get have at least try the chocolate bars and listen along to it too. Um, think about a theme. Yeah, do it again. Um, I think the whole fruit chocolate thoughts. I'm guessing that means the bars being made with instead of sugar, the um, juice from the the, the mucilage, which is kind of interesting because there's a lot of big companies. So that one's interesting. So you know, if if any of you have ever tasted the so that you know the bean, the raw bean has this pulp called mucilage around it that's very sticky and sweet and tart. And it has a very high sugar content. That's how you ferment it. But if you've ever been to country of origin and had the pleasure of tasting it, it's kind of like eating a lychee. It's very sweet and tart and lovely. 
um, they use, you know, they use that juice on there for fermentation, but when they first start to ferment the beans, a lot of that juice runs off and it used to just be waste. Um, um, but recently companies have started capturing it. Some have been selling it, um, yeah. as a pulp. It's very, as I said, very high sugar content, very tasty, but some of the really large companies like Nestle and those guys are actually refining it into sugar and using it um, instead of sugar. And I think there's a lot of um, argument between them and, and government regulatory bodies as to whether they can call it unsweetened chocolate or like no sugar added chocolate because they're using, or uh, like hundred percent chocolate because they're using the juice from the bean, but you know, it's still very high sugar content. It's just not cane sugar. But I, I'm assuming that's the whole fruit chocolate thoughts there. Yeah. Uh, Louisa would add a bit more information about the farmer location where beans came from fermentation. We briefly touched on it as we move through them today. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we could do a deep dive on that. I think today was more of a um, getting to know Spencer and Lauren and, 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 and conversation, but that would be a really interesting one, actually, if we did more of a deep dive on fermentation. I mean, to the degree that we can yeah know what they're doing yeah i mean so we did it actually so i, I mean we do it a little bit so we, we have two we have like two different we have two or three different makers who diff, do different fermentations so i don't know if you can see these bars and i'm not holding them up differently so these are the frizz hole double turn triple turn fermentation bars and they do show that and we we do have those i'll make uh, we'll sort of send those around um you can definitely do that the other people who do a lot on this uh, in mexico um um crack do that and we actually put the, one of those into um um one of the things but we, we can definitely deal with competition there aren't that many examples though of actually people using i think we've only got three or four of actually with the fermentation it's the same with conching and roasts you know the only people i, I think the only person actually really who's playing with with roasts and conches is 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 um rob anderson um well, he's the only one putting it on the label. So Fresco Chocolate, who's here near Seattle, um, he will put roasting and conching treatments on his label. And as he points out, like everybody is using a different machine, right? So his conch is going to be different than someone else's. So when he says medium conch on a bar, that could be something different in someone else's machine. But he will put like light roast, dark roast, medium roast. He will put, you know, short conch or subtle conch long conch whatever on his bars so he's yeah. he's actually calling it out whereas others are not necessarily doing that yeah but he also actually releases them as um um he actually releases them um the bars so you can get them so whereas most people don't do two 70 percent with different roasts he does do that so um i'm just thinking about how we pick the bars for the next ones uh, um so there's some interesting comments over here in chat yeah i'm just going if you're um, picking Kevin's got I'm reading them. I'm kind of taking them in here. So, so Linda, do... yeah. So the, 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 the juice from the beans is like, I remember when we were, we were selling but briefly, there was like, you could get in a Tetra pack, the juice. And I had a customer walk in and she looked and she's like, wow, they must be adding a lot of sugar to this. And I was like, nope, no sugar added. It's just very high in sugar content because that's how the fermentation starts. Um, but they do have a lot of extra. So, um, so they don't remove it. It's critical for fermentation. You have to have that in order for the beans to ferment. Um, I think there've been a number of comments, both in the chat and on the Mentimeter about doing inclusion bars. So bars with things added to them. Um, I'm interpreting one of the comments to mean like, maybe if there's a chocolate origin, a plain one that the maker also has an inclusion, that could be kind of an interesting comparison. Yeah, um, that's very good. If you're picking... And then, and then somebody here, Kevin says, if you're picking chocolate, I have three very different, I've had three very different Tanzanian ones. He liked today's, but he previously didn't. How do you pick if you haven't tried it previously? You know, I always say that, unfortunately, there really is no way to know until you taste something. Like, I'll start by reading the ingredients on a bar, if it's a bar I know nothing about. Um, and Spencer and I didn't really talk about ingredients today, but that's one thing I think we both cover in our, our tasting yeah. classes pretty heavily because mass market chocolate has a lot of crappy ingredients, right? So it's, you have to start by reading the ingredients. If you get a clean ingredient slate, then you really don't know until you taste the chocolate. And you may have to go through some that you don't like and, you know, and to find the ones that you do. But I guess that's a perfect example um, from Kevin about just because one maker you don't like their Tanzania origin, for example, doesn't mean you might not like someone else's. So I would say try a few different makers doing the same origin. And then if you decide, you know, I haven't liked the flavor notes of this origin on any maker, okay, maybe that's not your favorite origin. 
Um, but I, I would just say, give it, you're going to have to taste a lot. And the, you know, that's part of the fun, right? Getting the experience. Maybe you get some family or friends over and you get a bunch of bars and you sit down and try them together so that, you know, you're getting many thoughts and you're not wasting that bar. If you decide you don't like it, maybe somebody else does. Um, that can be a really fun way to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think that, that, yeah, I mean, I think that's where the, the Kevin's point, I think that's where actually Lauren, your one is so good, which is you run it through a group of people. And if everybody thinks it's great, then you'll take it on. I mean, I find that some, I'm not going to name any names here, but I do find that some, sometimes I make it can make some bars, which are great and other bars, which just aren't so good. And so we don't, we very rarely, there are very, very few makers. We've got about 150 makers on the site and there are very, very few of those that will take all the bars. Yeah. Um, just because we just we just feel that some of them are better expressions than others. Right. Um, um, that was very true for us at Chocolopolis too. I mean, we would take the ones we really liked, um, and that was usually a handful from from a couple of different makers. I mean, from each maker, it was not an entire line. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is I think that is absolutely right. Uh, one other actual just just quick comment just to go back to the the thing that you were saying though about the 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 i don't know if it's yet hit the states in europe now you're suddenly seeing cocoa pulp arriving in massive um volumes and the story behind this actually is that there's quite an interesting story which is um the that what actually a couple of the i think um, i think it's ecom who discovered this that one of the problems with ccn 51 i don't know if any of you which is basically the bar that you get in lots of in South America, which is sort of supposedly the bean, which is supposedly disease resistant. But actually, if you've ever had bars made out of it, even Fire Tree, who I think are an outstanding chocolate maker, have actually made a CCN 51. And even they say this is a difficult bar for them. And, and so Martin is just an amazing chocolate maker. Um, but you compare it to the Ariba nationality he's got, and it just doesn't taste anything like as good. And actually now, one of the reasons why they think that this, that this bean is actually problematic is that when it was genetically engineered, it has too much pulp. So the mm. fermentation process is very difficult to control. And so a lot of the, so Pasha, for example, and the stuff that Coco Latitudes are producing um, 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 is actually made from the excess juice of CCN51, which you don't want to use in the fermentation anyhow. So it's even better um, in a strange way, you know, because you, you wouldn't really want them taking too much pulp out of some of the great chocolate bars because you wouldn't want them messing the fermentation by risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, and just to back up the CCN51, for those who don't know, was it was a genetically engineered cocoa bean. Um, a guy in Ecuador did it. Um, and it requires, it grows fast and it's more disease resistant, more productive, um, but it's not known for flavor and it's a water hog. So it's terrible for the environment. But yeah. it's um, taken over a lot of South America, and so um, so it is very productive, but has some downsides. <laughs> so Ke Kevin's just made a very good suggestion, I think, too, and maybe we should think about sort of following up with a survey to ask you to give us more feedback on that, and then wrap up and let you go and have the rest of your days. Um, yeah, I suddenly realized actually we didn't pick any South American; we picked African bars, um, which was not. I don't think we actually set out to do that, um, but yeah, I mean. Definitely, um, you know, do an Urumbaba from Peru. We can definitely do that. Do you like having the European US tasting sort of comparison of getting a European maker and a US maker? Because yeah, we could definitely do that. We could definitely pick some um, bars and we could definitely sort of pick three different interpretations of, you know, Ariba Nacional and three or two different interpretations of Ariba Nacional and then Urumbaba and then um, Alachua maybe from Guatemala or something like that. So why don't we try and come up with that then too? The, the other thing I would love to sort of say, and I said this to Lauren too, is that if, look, if you've got boxes or if you want to be chocolate DJs, we are desperate to get Lauren to be a chocolate DJ. A chocolate DJ is somebody who basically curates their own bars. If you guys want us to put together boxes of gifts that you want other people to give, we will do that for you very willingly. It's very, very easy for us to do. Um, you know, just, just you know, we'll, we'll, we'll set you up with boxes. You can have gift boxes and everything else like that. If you want to use them for tasting for friends and stuff like that, please just let us know and we will do that. And if you've got tasting notes that you want people to be able to print out too, we can put that up on the website too. So, um, um, yeah. All right. Well, but this I have to say, great. Thanks, Spencer. No, thank you, Lauren. I cannot thank you enough. And um, and the, the, the next time we should do this, we should basically start with pictures of our swimming experiences too.
So I think next time we're going to basically show you where we've been swimming. Um, so I don't know if you were swimming. This <laughs> yeah, we didn't mention that. We, we That was the other thing we figured out. We're both open water swimmers. So I guess if Spencer comes back to the Northwest Chocolate Festival anytime soon, we'll be getting in Puget Sound together. We definitely will. We'll definitely be paddling. Yeah. So I'm actually taking so the, the Canopy Market next next week. Um, I've actually, we're going to basically take as many makers as we can and take them for a plunge in the ponds just around the corner from where I live. <laughs> and um, just to put this in context, I don't know, like you're Fahrenheit, aren't you? So we are now at 13 degrees centigrade, which I think is probably like low 50s. So this is going to be a shock for some of the guys and they're not allowed to wear wetsuits. So it'll oh, be okay. I'm, I'm totally wearing wetsuits in Puget Sound. No, I think the last time I was, it's, it's, what, what is Puget Sound? It's like 14? Right now, it, in the summer, it gets up to 57. In the winter, it's down to 47. Right now, it's probably in the mid 50s. It's gotten pretty cold here. So the, I mean, it's like in the 50, the temperature outside is about 50. So I think it's probably around 52 on the water now would be my guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I will drop everybody an email um, late, probably tomorrow, if that's okay, uh, with just follow-ups. If you've got any questions, please just email me back. So I've got details that you want the pump street, that you want the fermentation bar details. I'll send you details of both of those. If there's anything else that you want, please let us know. And I, I really meant what I said. I mean, we love, you know, Lauren is one of our favorite chocolate DJs. We're going to get her to basically curate some boxes. Um, and we'd love it if you guys help her curate those boxes too. This has been great fun. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you so much. All right. Good to see everybody. Thank you so much. Hi, Mom. <laughs> I had to say that. Hi, Mom. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. Wishing you all.